The scientific name of any species of organism has at least two, sometimes three parts. We will use dogs as an example. Whenever you use the scientific name of a species, you need to follow some formatting conventions. First, the name must be italicized. Then, it must be written in the correct order. We start with the genus, in this case Canis. The genus name is capitalized. Then we list the species name, Lupus. This word is not capitalized. If an animal is a subspecies, there will be a third word. This is a specific epithet which lets you know the animal has a slight distinction from the rest of its species. Dogs are widely considered to be a subspecies of wolves, although, as with everything in taxonomy, there is some debate around this classification. So when we put the whole name together, we have Canis lupus familiaris. What about our kitties? So for cats, we're going to start with the genus, which would in this case be Felis. The next would be the species name Sylvestris, and the specific epithet or subspecies Catus. So when we put it all together, we have Felis Sylvestris Catus. Each companion animal species has its own taxonomic classifications as well as a specific domestication story. Guinea pigs descend from either Brazilian guinea pigs or Montane guinea pigs, or possibly both. They were originally bred for meat. They are still consumed regularly in parts of South America where they were originally domesticated five to 7,000 years ago. As you can see, domesticated guinea pigs are considered to be different enough from their ancestors to be considered their own species, Cavia porcellus. Rabbits are believed to have first been domesticated in monasteries as a food source. They were decreed a form of fish, so people were allowed to eat them during Lent. Therefore, monks kept them around in monasteries so that they could have some non-fish fish to have during Lent. While they have become more popular as pets, you can still buy rabbit meat and fur here in the United States. Rabbits were domesticated a mere 1,500 years ago, and the domestic rabbit is not even considered its own subspecies. It is still shares the same species name as its progenitor. While domestication was a unique, nuanced process for each species involved, two generalizations can be made about how the process was started. Human-mediated domestication is the theory of domestication where animals were selected by humans specifically to be more docile and useful. Self-domestication is the theory of domestication where animals took charge of the domestication process, with the animals who could exist near people being the ones to most likely reproduce. Both versions likely played a role for each domesticated species to some degree, but most animals are thought to have begun the domestication process themselves. Humans then began mediating the later stages of domestication by actively selecting individuals to breed together. So since animals are so beneficial to us, then why have relatively few species been domesticated? Well, domestication is a long, drawn-out process requiring humans and animals to be in close proximity for long periods of time before animals truly become domesticated. Therefore, wild animal species possessing traits conducive to being kept in captivity are much easier to domesticate. Species which live in large, stable groups with flexible social hierarchies are generally easier to keep in captivity because they would have stuck close to their family group. They feel comfortable being in very close proximity to their herd at all times, so they can be kept in pens together. Humans would also be able to infiltrate the social hierarchy and be seen as one of the group. Short generation times are in relation to the human lifespan. Animals that reach maturity quickly can be produced faster, and it is easier to keep track of their breeding. Animals like elephants, which can take up to 15 years to reach maturity, mean people could not easily breed a lot of them in their own lifetime. A calm disposition was critical. Along with being incredibly adept at escaping, gazelle and antelope will panic easily. Even if they could not manage to jump out of their enclosure, they could run headlong into a fence, and their flighty nature made it difficult for people to hang onto them for any amount of time. 
Being a fussy eater makes an animal much harder to domesticate. In order for animals to become domesticated, their food has to be easy enough for the average first person to find. If you can think of a panda, you're not going to be able to find bamboo nearly anywhere all over the world, like you would be able to find grass for a cow. The animal must mate readily in captivity. Egyptians attempted to domesticate cheetahs as hunting partners, but they failed because the cheetah cannot breed in captivity. Their elaborate mating ritual requires the male to chase the female for days over great distances before she will allow him to mate. This ensures that she has a prime physical specimen as a mate, but it also ensures they are impossible to domesticate. And until now, the animal had to be useful. Leisure time and excess income is fairly new to humans, and until now, only the richest people could afford pets purely for leisure. So if an animal could not provide food or labor, there was little point in people having them around. Most animals were domesticated as a source of food. Both dogs and cats are unique among our domesticated animals in that they are descended from predatory species.